these are the official atlases of the uh, Civil War from the um, Secretary of War. And it's a little bit busy. This is the Mississippi. St. Louis, where they spend until mid-September. Cape Girardeau is where General Grant is. He's just become general, and he's building armies down there, and he's eventually going to be jumping down through Kentucky and down to Forts Henry and Donaldson and Shiloh and such, but that's well into the future. Here is Ironton or Pilot Knob. It's down this railroad. It's the oldest railroad in Missouri, and they're stationed at Pilot Knob. And these two towns are just right next to each other, the same place. And there's Fredericktown where this battle is going to occur. This is what Pilot Knob Camp looked like. It's from Harper's Weekly, probably. And John wrote back to her, there are only four comp there is only four companies in our regiment here yet under Major Davitt, spelled, that's the way he's spelled it, who is just the man for the place. At Evansville, I expected to have difficulty of a very serious nature with him, but it is all over now. He treats me with more respect than any man in camp. If we divide our battalion, I expect to have charge of one half. Colonel Baker, I think, will be down in a few days to this place. Baker was a very good organizer, and he's trying to get this, this, this regiment outfitted. It's because they're full strength, and they're ready. And I think the kind of duty they're doing, if you think about it, almost like Afghanistan, where they're on a peacekeeping mission, because Missouri's a mess. It's a slave state that um, stayed in the Union, but officially it didn't stay in the Union, and there's internal warfare, and a lot of, you know, it, it's, it's a messy state. It's a messy state, and it stayed that way for quite a while. And a lot of what they're doing is putting down rebel groups running through burning bridges and knocking down telegraph lines and those kind of things. That's what it looks like today. That is, that is Pilot Knob. Uh, okay, I thought this was interesting. Also, I've made a considerable acquisition in the way of a darkie. I have a very nice colored boy to wait on me free of charge. There were six men, collared, run off from Arkansas and came here for protection. Their master moved there and found the Southern Army and wanted his men to go, who ran off and came here traveling at night. The major gave me one for my own use. Now, in Civil War times, you call him a darkie is pretty gentle because if you're looking for enlightened racial attitudes, you're not going to find them here. They, 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 they would have been rare. In Richard Owens, History of the New Harmony. He's got some comments about Frances Wright, who, you know, she got to the point where the only solution was for blacks and whites to be able to marry and intermingle. And he, and he said that that's obviously she was wrong there. That would just pollute the white race. And I think that's, you know, that's the prevailing attitude. I think if you get in Boston, you get around uh, Emily Dickinson, there's some people up in there, you're going to find some. There were some who were clearly thought it was about slavery. Mm -hmm. It takes us until Lincoln explained to us, maybe in the second uh, inaugural, that the war really was about slavery. I mean, clearly, the Civil War is about slavery. It, you know, it, it, but it, it took them a while to figure that out because there was no way to put the country back together with slavery still in it. It, just, it wasn't going to happen. So I don't know how long he kept the darky. There's no more comfort, no one thinks about it. My dear wife, when I travel through this country, I can't help thinking, God, that my wife and children are Indiana, are in Indiana. Unionism and secessionism is pretty equally divided here. Uh, and if you happen to be in the wrong place on the wrong side and spoke out too much, you could get hanged by either one side or the other. Uh, so that's where they were. That's where they're going to end up going. And that's where General Grant is. And it's because he wasn't Confederate regular army. He was Missouri State Guard. But he had, this was largely a mounted but some infantry units. And he was causing a lot of trouble, burning railroad bridges and things like that here. And they'd already been skirmishing with the 1st Indiana uh, before this big battle. They're in Fredericktown because there are big lead deposits there. And it's enough of a problem, and it's remained a problem actually throughout the war, that Grant sent out a colonel with 1,500 men, another colonel with 3,500 men from Ironton, including the 1st Indiana, to get rid of this behind him. So these were both West Pointers. Um, that's, that's the Confederate general, Jeff Thompson. Fredericktown, Missouri today, um, none of these buildings existed then. 
Uh, but it's you know, so traditional, it's a, it's a town square. You can drive all around it. This road is going south and out of town. And it'll be there in about a mile. Uh, today, this is the battlefield that they've kept. The cemetery wasn't there. The, this was a cornfield. This was a fence line. And up in here is going to be where the Union troops are. And down here, the Confederate troops. And this is from the battlefield. And so the, the, the major battle of Frederick Town is occurring right in here, um, right around that cornfield. Only picture that's known from it was in the New York papers. Um, and this would be across the cornfield and the infantry companies. First Indiana is not involved in this. They're sitting back on the hill uh, observing. Confederates are beaten and they begin to leave the field. Colonel Plummer, I think, makes a mistake thinking they're in a rout. So he told the first Indiana to charge after them. He wasn't in a rout. He was leaving orderly, but he lay an ambush right down here at the bottom of that road. Um, so this is where that colonel would have been looking at that road there. That's the same road today they say that was there then. Uh, and you see, you can't see down it. You're at the top of a hill and you can't see down it. Oops, I went too far. I went a little bit down there to look back up. You see, and they're, they're running downhill. Uh, I think the charging by Colonel Ford is down this hill. Turn going the other way. If you look here, right there, if there's a Confederate unit there, they're effectively on the left, the right, the front, and the rear. And that's what happened. So as they came down that hill right there, they, they ran into that ambush. Um, and again, see, it's, it's Vandenberg County, Posey County boys. It was half of the company, half of the regiment, of the, and it was people from here. The Confederate battle reports say the entire front line of the 1st Indiana Cavalry crumpled when, that, when, the, when the shots went off. John Smith Gavitt out in the lead, he's the county sheriff of Vandenberg County, five bullets and he dies instantly on the battlefield. Somebody went out from the Confederate side and grabbed his sword. Um, Charlie McLean, 17 years, 10 months, four, shot in the forehead. And he died probably instantly on the battlefield. John Kel Hyman, shot in the back, came through the heart. He died probably instantly on the battlefield. Alexander uh, Allison, the corporal, shot in the stomach. He didn't die at that point. But to be shot in the stomach at that point in the, in the Civil War battle, you're going to die. You're just going to die in a couple of days, and you're going to hurt a whole bunch. Uh, so, and there were others, but I'm sticking with these four because they're the four funerals. Uh, and they can, you know, I think the last one died in June of the next year uh, from these battle wounds. That's not from the first Indiana, that's from Washington, D.C. That home still exists, and they took the body of John Kel Hyman and Major Gavitt and put them on that porch, detached Julian Dale Owen. Julian Dale Owen accompanied those bodies, and actually Charlie McLean's too, from Fredericktown to Ironton, back up to St. Louis, from St. Louis to uh, Vincennes, and from Vincennes back to Evansville. And the papers are counting on this all the time, but now here, it's probably how Jane found out about her husband's death. Uh, it was in the Evansville Daily Journal, Journal on the 23rd. We have sad news in this morning's journal from the 1st Indiana Cavalry. Major Gavitt and Captain Hyman have fallen while gallantly leading their men to a charge upon a rebel battery. I'll leave the rest of it to what's going on there. But again, I transcribed that and they didn't do pictures then. But probably that's how Jane found out because that's how Achille found out. The journal was the, has the account of a very hard-fought battle at Pilot Knob in which the 1st Regiment Indiana Cavalry was prominent and lost their distinguished and brave leaders, Major Gavitt and Captain John K. Hyman of our Harmony. It cast a gloom over our little settlement for Captain Hyman was loved, honored, and respected by a great many. A lot of them were killed and wounded and 200 rebels killed. Jewel D. Owen will arrive here Thursday with Captain Hyman's corpse who fell while gallantly leading his company against a rebel battery. 
The next day, hard frost, ice last night, here. He, he's very, this is his entry. I mean, they're, very, they're, not, they're not detailed. Paul and Mr. Hugo went to Evansville. They sent the hearse up after Captain Heinemann's corpse. Paul will buy a few things and come back in the stage tomorrow, I guess. Captain Hyman will be buried at our graveyard. We have not yet heard who else from that regiment were wounded or killed. So he didn't know if Alex is dead, because it hasn't been published yet. Um, these are various things I've transcribed from the Evansville Daily Journal. Um, and it's actually just tracking the bodies back from, like I said, from Pilot Knob down to uh, Ben Sins, and eventually to Evansville for the funerals. This is in the archives here, and apparently Julian Dale Owen bought a rosewood casket and with handles uh, in uh, St. Louis for John Kell Hyman's body, and he probably came back in a rosewood casket, uh, paid for, I believe, by the Odd Fellows. That's, that's back there with the, the details on it. The arrival of the remains of Major Gavin and Captain Hyman and Private McLean drew to the depot a large crowd of our citizens. A committee of citizens appointed from the companies of the Legion escorted the remains of Major Gavitt from the depot to his res residence on Clark Street, where they will remain until the funeral. The remains of Captain Hyman were escorted by the Evansville Band and City Guards to their armory on Main Street, where they lay in state until 11 o'clock last night when they left for New Harmony, accompanied by a mounted escort of the guards. The remains of Captain Hyman, while in the armory, were placed upon a raised platform, appropriately covered with black. A canopy formed of American flag is draped in mourning, hung gracefully over the coffin, which is wrapped in the old flag he had given his life to defend. The sentinels of the city guards watched the honored remains until the hour of their departure. So no doubt a lot of people visited John Kill Hyman while he was in the armory. Achilles' journal picks up a bit of the story. Clear, pleasant day. Lieutenant Owens did not arrive last night with Captain Hyman's body. He missed the connection, but will be here tonight or in the morning. We heard that Alex had been sick, a chill. Pa did not get back today. We heard that Ed Beal, it must have been his dad on that other letter from the Odd Fellows, of the 25th Regiment was dead and the whole nearly sick, only 200 able to do duty. The 26th. Cloudy and clear by spells, rather warmer. Paul, Jewel Owen, Lieutenant, and escort arrived here today about 5 o'clock a.m. with the remains of Captain Hyman. The escort was from the, from the Crescent City Guards and under Richard Hornbrook. They opened the captain's coffin. I saw him. He was not much changed. They took him out where home where he will be left until 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Paul brought a few things in Evansville. They arrived today. Jewel says Alex was exhausted by a 70-mile ride and was not in the Fredericktown, Fredericktown battle. He sent home his letters and journal. Good. Does he, it's really a matter of fact, like I saw the dead body and then we also got things for the store. Uh, so he was not much changed. Other than the fact, I guess he was dead. Um, we won't read that, but... Uh, <laughs> The account in the Evansville Daily Journal of the, fun the, of the funeral of these two, they're, they're buried in Oak Hill Cemetery. This is Major John Smith Gavin and Private Charles McLean. They were buried in Oak Hill. Their funeral procession started at First Street and out by Channel 9, met at Main, and walked to uh, a long procession, walked to Oak Hill Cemetery. Uh, that's John Smith Gavin's grave. Um, it's slightly behind the main house at Oak Hill Cemetery, and there's Charlie McLean's grave, uh, a little bit farther up the hill. This is John Smith Gavin and his wife, who's been who was dead two years earlier, and I don't know the cause of death for her. Um, he left uh, three children and a widowed grandmother, a mother, and the account says that as they gathered around the coffin, they opened it for the last time, and the mother broke out in tears, and the crowd gathered around, and the guard couldn't keep the, guard, the crowd from get, coming to the coffin and dropping in sprigs of evergreen. And then uh, a very solemn scene, and then they left, and there he is. That's, he was 37. 